Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be discussing toxicology as part of our clinical chemistry lecture series. All right, let's get started. is toxicology and why is it relevant to us as clinical laboratory professionals? Toxicology is defined as the study of toxicants and poisons. In the clinical laboratory, medical laboratory technicians and scientists can identify and quantify toxicants and poisons associated with accidental and intentional overdoses. There are a couple of factors that influence how toxic something is to the human body how soluble the compound is in tissues and in body fluids. If the, compounds is, uh, the compound is lipid soluble, it's more readily absorbed by the body and could in turn be more toxic because of that. The physical state of the compound also influence how influences how toxic it is. If the compound is a gas, it can reach the circulation much quicker than a solid compound. Uh, so you're going to be more quickly affected by something you inhale versus something that is solid. So you would have to ingest that compound for it and, and of course, have it dissolve before it had any effect. So gas is going to be a quicker method of entry. How long someone is exposed to the compound or how frequently someone is exposed to it is also a factor. The person's age, genetics, and overall state of health can have an effect on how toxic a compound is as well. And of course, the pharmacokinetics of the compound. And we'll discuss pharmacokinetics in the therapeutic drug monitoring uh, lecture, uh, but this is the study of drug di disposition within the body. Uh, so this is the course of drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug in the body. The most common drug overdoses seen in the emergency room are alcohol overdoses, analgesic overdoses, so this is from aspirin and Tylenol, depressants, which include barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and antidepressants, and also stimulants like cocaine or methamphetamine, and heroin and morphine, which are opiate drugs. Urine, blood, and gastric contents can all be used for the screening of drugs. Urine is most often uh, the sample of choice because drugs and their metabolites can be detected over a longer uh, time in urine uh, than in blood. Uh, drug screens are often qualitative tests, which can either give a positive or a negative result. So we'll discuss qualitative versus quantitative testing a lot within uh, clinical chemistry. A qualitative test will give you a yes, no answer or a positive negative answer. So for example, yes, the patient has cocaine in their system or no, the patient does not have cocaine in their system. A quantitative test gives a specific quantity of a substance that is present in the patient's system. For example, there is X amount of cocaine in the blood. These positive screens can then be confirmed and quantitated by mass spectrophotometry, uh, MS, is the most discriminatory of the drug testing techniques. Mass spec is not a testing method that is done in hospital laboratories. Uh, for uh, confirmation uh, using uh, mass spec, the sample will need to be sent out to a specialized reference laboratory. A mass spectrometry uh, measures the precise molecular mass of ions as determined by their mass to charge ratio and is the current gold standard in forensic drug analysis. So working in a hospital laboratory, you'll likely see a lot of drug assays be performed. The recommended stat qualitative urine drug assays are the following. And remember, so these are recommended, recommended qualitative tests. So these are saying, yes, the patient has it in their system or no, the patient does not have it in their system. So these are cocaine, opiates, barbiturates, tricyclic antidepressants, amphetamines, PCP, and uh, pro Fosophenes, which is an opioid uh, pain reliever. So why are these commonly qualitative tests? So from a clinical uh, perspective, the amount of these types of drugs taken is not necessary to know just if the patient has taken it or has not taken it. So for example, cocaine, right? It doesn't make a difference clinically to the patient if they have taken a ton of cocaine or a little bit of cocaine. The doctor just wants to know if they have or have not taken cocaine and have it presently in their blood and urine. 
the recommended stat quantitative drug assays are the following. And remember, so these are recommended quantitative tests. So this is giving the doctor the exact amount of drug uh, that is present in the patient's body. Acetaminophen and salicylate. So this is Tylenol and aspirin. Lithium, this is a drug taken for the treatment of bipolar disorder. Theophylline, which is a bronchodilator. Valproic acid, carbamazepine, and phenobarbital, which are anti-epileptic drugs, so for the prevention of seizures. Digoxin, which is a heart medication, and also volatile substances, which are substances that evaporate at room temperature. So examples of volatiles that we test for in the clinical lab are ethanol, methanol, and ethylene glycol. Ethanol is alcohol that is uh, in the drinkable form of alcohol. Methanol is used in fuel and things like formaldehyde. And then ethylene glycol is the fancy term for antifreeze. For urine drug screens, it's imperative to ensure that the sample is not adulterated, diluted, or substituted. Patients can adulterate their urine specimen by adding bleach, vinegar, lemon juice, detergents, or other adulterants purchased online. As medical laboratory professionals, there are a few criteria that we can um, use to help us determine if the specimen is, uh, is a fresh, unaltered urine sample. So if the sample has just been collected, it should be around 32 to 37 degrees Celsius, which is close to body temperature. And that makes sense, right? So because you will be analyzing the urine specimen shortly after collection. So it should be roughly around uh, the patient's body temperature. The specific gravity of the sample should be greater than 1.003, and the pH should be from 5 to 8. Also, the creatinine level of a urine sample should be at the very least 20 milligrams per deciliter. If a medical laboratory technologist or scientist is performing a drug screen and feels that the sample has been tampered with in any way, they can always request a recollection of the urine. Upon ingestion, ethanol is rapidly absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract and then metabolized in the liver. It is a depressant on the central nervous system by blocking inhibitory centers. It's critical when collecting a blood specimen for an ethanol test that the venipuncture site is cleaned with either betadine or soap and water. An alcohol pad is not appropriate for the cleansing of the site for an ethanol test. Ethanol is considered a volatile compound and the tube uh, must be kept stoppered. And just as a little tidbit of advice here, I've run into countless times in situations where the emergency room nurses or physicians will call down and request an ethanol level to be added onto a sample. So this means like, let's say a patient came into the ER and they did a basic metabolic panel and we would still obviously have that sample down in the laboratory from doing that panel. So they'll call down to the lab and request other tests be added on. And 99% of the time they're gonna have used an alcohol prep pad to clean the venipuncture site so ethanol can't be added onto prior samples. So some hospital labs have policies where you just can't add on an ethanol to a sample due to this and also of course because it's a uh, volatile sample meaning the ethanol will evaporate off the sample if it isn't stoppered. Or sometimes they will have a policy that the person collecting the sample uh, needs to attest that they've collected the sample with betadine and not an alcohol prep pad. It just kind of depends on whatever lab you work in. And the easiest way truly is just to collect a new sample for ethanol testing rather than adding it on. So again, it's critical when collecting a blood specimen for an ethanol test that the venipuncture site is cleaned with either betadine or soap and water. An alcohol pad is not appropriate for the cleansing of the site for an ethanol test. So ethanol is considered a volatile compound and the tube must be kept stoppered, which we've already discussed. Now, some drug screens come with something called a chain of custody. So this is a paper trail of all the people who have had contact with the specimen from its collection to testing to where it is then stored. So this can be used in a court of law, so it's imperative for medical lab professionals to understand their specific laboratory's policies and procedures on uh, samples that have a chain of custody. Oftentimes, ethanol levels uh, can have a chain of custody form. 
Uh, an example of a reasoning for this is like, let's say there's a car accident and there's probable cause for alcohol to have been a contributing factor. Alcohol levels in that case can be used in a court of law. So a chain of custody will be needed for that sample. Wherever laboratory you work at, they will have a specific chain of custody policy, which will tell you exactly what is expected of you in regards to this. Alcohol will raise the blood's osmolality level. So around 60 milligrams per deciliter of ethanol will raise the osmo level by 10 milliosmoles per kilogram. And again, osmolality is the concentration of a solution expressed as the total number of solute particles per kilogram in the blood. Other volatiles um, other than ethanol um, are uh, methanol. Uh, so this is a common solvent and is present in formaldehyde and is also a contaminant in moonshine. Isopropanol, which is rubbing alcohol. So sometimes patients will ingest both of these. Ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, is also something we can test for in the laboratory. An important thing to note about antifreeze is when a patient ingests it, uh, you can see calcium oxalate crystals in their urine sample. And if you recall from urinalysis, uh, the calcium oxalate crystals look like those really cute little diamond ring-like cross-shaped crystals. Uh, so you can see a drawing depiction of what those crystals look like on the right-hand side of this slide. Now, it's also important to note that just because you see calcium oxalate crystals in the urine doesn't mean that the patient has ingested antifreeze. It's just one reason why these crystals may be present in the urine. Carbon monoxide is a tasteless, colorless gas with no odor. Carbon monoxide has a greater affinity for hemoglobin as opposed to oxygen. So that means that hemoglobin is going to bind to the carbon monoxide in place of oxygen. It likes the carbon monoxide more than the oxygen. So when inhaled via the lungs, carbon monoxide binds to the hemoglobin in the body, forming carboxyhemoglobin. And this carboxyhemoglobin gives a patient's venous blood a deep cherry red color. Patients can get poisoned from carbon monoxide unintentionally through smoke inhalation, broken furnaces, and staying in an automobile uh, with the windows and doors closed. Carbon monoxide poisoning can also occur with suicidal attempts via automobiles or stoves that use gasoline. Non-smokers have very small amounts of carboxyhemoglobin, under 0.5% of hemoglobin, um, is carboxyhemoglobin, whereas people who smoke have 5 to 15% of their hemoglobin as carboxyhemoglobin. Now, if a patient has 30% of all of their hemoglobin as carboxyhemoglobin, they can become fatigued and have a headache. At 60%, the patient is rendered unconscious, and at 80%, this is where the patient it dies, so it is fatal. Salicylate, or aspirin, is commonly used as an anti-inflammatory and pain medication. High levels of salicylate ingestion leads to imbalances in the acid-base balance of the body, initially causing respiratory alkalosis due to hyperventilation, then to metabolic acidosis. Aspirin is associated with something called Reyes syndrome in children. And recall, I believe in um, the lecture on liver function testing, I discussed Reyes syndrome. So this is a rare disorder that often occurs after a child has a viral infection that causes uh, swelling in the liver and can also cause swelling in the brain. Acetaminophen or Tylenol is a pain reliever. Overdoses of acetaminophen cause necrosis to the liver in a few days after ingestion. Acetaminophen is recommended for pain relief in children due to the association of salicylate with that Reyes syndrome. Marijuana is a psychoactive drug derived from the cannabis sativa plant. The active ingredient in marijuana is tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. THC is soluble in lipids and is stored within fatty tissue. The metabolites of THC can be detected in a patient's urine weeks after drug use. So this picture on the right-hand side is a marijuana plant. Cocaine is derived from the coca plant. Uh, and acts as a stimulant to, the, stimulant to the central nervous system. The active ingredient in cocaine is called benzoylgonine. It can either be inhaled, smoked, taken orally, or uh, be uh, uh, injected via IV. Uh, the drug is rapidly metabolized and can be detected mainly in the urine. Overdoses of cocaine can cause a patient to have seizures, heart attack, or heart arrhythmia, which is an improper beating of the heart. Barbiturates are a group of central nervous system depressants that cause sleep. 
Uh, there are three groups of barbiturates, ones that are short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. When a patient overdoses on, our, on a barbiturate, it causes a depression of the respiratory system. When used in combination with ethanol, uh, so alcohol drinks, uh, the effects of the drug are potentiated, meaning they are worse. Amphetamines are drugs that stimulate the central nervous system. They increase alertness and are appetite suppressors. They have a high potential for abuse with overdoses causing an increase in blood pressure and arrhythmias of the heart. Methamphetamine or meth and ecstasy are illegal street amphetamine examples. Opiates are drugs that are derived from the poppy plant. As you can see on the right hand side of the slide, those are poppies. Uh, they are used as sedatives, anesthetics, and pain relievers. There are, there are uh, naturally derived opiates such as opium, morphine, and codeine. Heroin, Dilaudid, and Oxycontin are modified natural opiates. Overdoses of opiates cause the depression of the respiratory system. There is actually an antidote for opiate overdoses uh, called naloxone or Narcan. Um, and Narcan is given usually uh, nasally as a spray uh, if somebody overdoses on an opiate. Organophosphates and carbamates containing common pesticides inhibit an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. So this acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that is responsible for breaking down a neurotransmitter called ACH. Um, and ACH is a neurotransmitter that is needed for the contraction of muscles. So when these organophosphates and carbamates in the pesticide are ingested, it leads to an accumulation of this ACH neurotransmitter, and this causes respiratory distress, bradycardia, and disruption of the gastrointestinal system. Laboratories can test for pesticide poisoning by running a serum pseudocholinesterase test. Pesticides cause a decrease in the activity of this enzyme pseudocholinesterase. So unfortunately, this assay does lack sensitivity and specificity, but it is what is used. Patients can also be poisoned by heavy metals such as arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. Arsenic is a tasteless, colorless, and odorless metal found in agriculture and also has industrial uses. Patients can experience acute or chronic arsenic poisoning. Cadmium is found in paint, batteries, and also in mines. This heavy metal can cause kidney failure if poisoned. Mercury is in batteries and disinfectants. Toxicity of mercury can inhibit certain enzymes within the body. It can also accumulate in fish that are exposed to industrial waste, which then can poison people who are consuming uh, these fish. Levels of lead can be found in old paint and pipes, as well as certain clay cookware. Lead disrupts the synthesis of heme, with children being the most susceptible. Uh, so heme is a part of hemoglobin, and that's responsible for transporting the oxygen in uh, red blood cells. So samples that are testing for lead levels must be whole blood specimens. Patients with this type of poisoning may have basophilic stippling present in their peripheral blood smear. So treatment for uh, lead poisoning is to give a chelating agent to bind the metal. So this photo on the right hand side of this slide shows a peripheral blood smear showing basophilic stippling. So here is a red cell that has basophilic stippling. These two have basophilic stippling and this also has uh, basophilic stippling. Um, so if you have not had hematology yet, um, I recommend looking, uh, watching my red blood cell morphology lecture uh, in my hematology lecture series. To, uh, I go into detail on what basophilic stippling is. But for those of you who have had it, so what's the, how are this, how is this basophilic stippling different than how jolly bodies? So with how jolly bodies, you'll just see one perfectly circular and dark dot in the red blood cell. So like for example, um, it would be, let's just do it here. Let's do it here. So it would be like that. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good Hal Jolly body. So that would be a Hal Jolly body, all right? And this is very different than this here, okay? And then what about for Pappenheimer? So with Pappenheimer's, they, they look very similar to basophilic stippling, but they're not all the way throughout the red blood cells. So they're just a in a cluster off to one side of the red blood cells. So I'll just pretend these are Pappenheimer's. So it's like Pappenheimer's look kind of like that, right? It's just one side, it, one portion of the red blood cell. Whereas basophilic stippling, as you can see, I'll just pretend that I'm doing basophilic stippling. There's basophilic stippling on this one. See how this looks very similar to all of these here? 
So basophilic stippling is all the way throughout the red blood cell. Alrighty, so if this video helped you, go ahead and give it a like, and please make sure to subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions about this lecture or um, you want to recommend another topic for me to discuss on my channel, please leave those comments in the comment section below. Until next time.